This is Michael Cowan, and welcome to Trial Lawyer Nation. You are the leader in the courtroom, and you want the jury to be looking to you for the answers. When you figure out your theory, never deviate. You want the facts to be consistent, complete, and credible. The defense has no problem running out the clock. Delay is the friend of the defense. It's tough to grow a firm by trying to hold on and micromanage. You've got to front load a simple structure for jurors to be able to hold on to. What types of creative things can we do as lawyers, even though we don't have a trial setting? Whatever you've got to do to make it real, you've got to do to make it real. But the person who needs convincing is you. Welcome to the award-winning podcast, Trial Lawyer Nation. Your source to win bigger verdicts, get more cases, and manage your law firm. And now, here's your host, noteworthy author, sought-after speaker, and renowned trial lawyer, Michael Cowan. Welcome to today's Trial Lawyer Nation. I'm joined by my partner, Mallory Peacock. And we're going to talk today about some fun stuff we've been doing on cases that involves the intersection of technology and driving. That's going to be everything from you know, drive cams, electronic logs, what they call telematics systems, where companies back home at the office can track what vehicles are doing out in the field, uh, and even how some of these applications actually cause crashes by distracting their drivers. Uh, Before I jump in, though, I want to thank our sponsor, Law Pods. Law Pods produces this podcast. They make it really, really easy for me. All I have to do is come here and talk to people. They do the recording, the editing. They make all the little ads for us that you might see on social media. And uh, if you want to do your own podcast, which is a lot of fun, uh, I highly recommend Law Pods. Mallory, how are you doing today? You know, I'm doing good. Um, I'm feeling really inspired by this topic today, and mostly because you were in my office earlier and we were talking about how technology is changing the legal field. You're talking about chat GPT and, you know, some of the things that it can do. And I've seen lawyers playing with it online and it's kind of fun, but um, technology has really changed uh, the way our cases work too. And so I think, I think it's a really interesting topic and we have tons and tons to learn about how it all works. Um, but we've learned quite a bit, um, you know, even in the last two years that I don't, I don't think we've talked about it on the podcast before. No, we haven't. And uh, this is something that more and more, you know, we're going less, from uh, you know, looking at someone's paper documents and trying to put the case together to having to get into the electronic data. So what are some of the sources of data we're looking at, Miller? Oh my gosh, there is so much in these 18-wheelers that, that drive down the road or even in just regular passenger cars that are um, part of a commercial fleet. There's so many options out there that um, companies can put on vehicles in order to monitor drivers um, and, you know, try to affect safety. So if you want to start with 18 wheelers, there's electronic logging devices that are now required. There's GPS tracking systems. There's specialized brake systems that can brake for you and they can um, do that, you know, automatic cruise control where it goes with the flow of traffic. Um, So there's all kinds of electronic systems on these vehicles. And a lot of them are, you know, combined systems, right? So you might have an electronic log system that's also combined with a GPS that's also combined with monitoring harsh braking or harsh cornering or something like that. And it's all one system. And then you might have three or four different systems in a vehicle um, that each do one isolated function. So uh, it's it's pretty interesting that the wide range of electronic systems that you can have outside of just the cell phone. I mean, uh, every truck driver out there has a cell phone. Um, and sometimes the, the cell phone is what's recording all of this uh, information too. So there's applications for the cell phone that can give you all of that stuff. And then there's systems that can be put on the vehicle itself to record this information. So all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And it's not just in our 18 wheeler cases. I mean, a lot of the companies that have fleets of vehicles have other similar tracking systems, even Domino's Pizza. I can order Domino's Pizza for my kids and then I can go online and track where that food is or Uber Eats. I can watch where that Uber Eats driver is. So can Uber Eats and Uber Eats gets all kinds of data. And even for normal passenger and passenger cars, of course, there's a trove of data, both good and bad on cell phones. Mm -hmm. Well, let's start with the, you know, since we do a lot of trucking, let's start with the trucking uh, stuff. So we talk about electronic logging device. What is an electronic logging device? So um, back in the day, 
drivers used to have to keep what's called a paper logbook. They had to track their hours um, in order to comply with the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulations, and it had to be in a specific format for logs. I mean, you had to keep track of certain information, so how long you were driving, how long you were um, off duty, how long you were on duty not driving. So there's different requirements for what you have to keep track of. Well, um, a couple of years ago, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration decided we're going to go all electronic and we're not going to do it on paper anymore, frankly, because there was a lot of cheating that was happening on paper. I mean, you just were relying on uh, the record keeping of the 18-wheeler driver who has incentives to not comply with the hours of service regulations to be truthful on those logbooks. So so they went all electronic. Um, and so it's basically the paper log, but in an electronic format, except the cool part about it is that it can uh, it gets GPS data to to tell you when the vehicle is actually moving and when it stopped. Um, so there's there's that extra added component to it that you wouldn't have with a paper log. Yeah, and I think it's important to keep in mind, it's not that these truck drivers are bad people, but there's some really perverse economic incentives in trucking. Mm -hmm. And so most truck drivers are only paid by the mile. And so the average, what they call detention time, when they go there to pick something up or drop something off at at a warehouse, they can be there from anywhere from three to eight hours, unless they're at one of the few, and it's very, very few companies that actually pay for what they call detention time. They don't get paid for any of that time. But that time counts against their m- number of hours they're allowed to work in an eight-day period uh, before they have to stop driving. Also, if they if they break down, if they get stuck in slow traffic, they're getting paid by the mile. So if you're in a traffic jam for an hour and you're going five miles an hour, you get paid for five miles, not for 60 miles. And you get to a point where you can't make a living unless you can somehow drive more hours than the regulations require you, allow you to drive. But the regulations are there because you know, you need sleep. They're already letting you work 14 hour days, driving up to 11 hours during that 14 hour day, you know, working 80 hour weeks, I'm sorry, 70 hour weeks. That's already a lot of hours. Uh, But unfortunately, they sometimes felt like they had to do more because if not, they can't afford to feed their families if their owner operators even make their truck payments. So they tried to, you know, there's such widespread cheating. They tried to eliminate that by making the logs electronic. So you know, the good thing about electronic logs is it's supposed to know whenever the truck is moving through the GPS device. So it's moving more than, let's say, five miles an hour. It picks up that it's moving and it automatically moves it to driving in the logs. Some downsides is it doesn't necessarily know who's driving and it doesn't know when you're not driving. Are you sleeping? Are you working? You know, it's still relying on honesty for that. Right, right. And then, um, you know, there's, I think, Michael, you've done some research into us into it. It seems like a foolproof system. The vehicle's moving, so it's logging you on duty. And, you know, it's up to the truck driver to figure out who's driving and all of that stuff. But, you know, I mean, it seems like how could you cheat on that? I mean, how, how could you yeah. how could you, you know, falsify your logbooks in that case? If the truck is moving, you're logged on duty. What do you how, how does that happen? Well, there's a lot of ways, unfortunately, that uh, truck drivers are able to cheat. Now, the most outrageous one. Uh, is with the cooperation of both the trucking company and the company that provides electronic logging device software. So the thing is, on the electronic logging devices, they're not supposed to be able to edit their driving time. So by law, you know, the the software is not supposed to allow anyone to change the amount of time the driver is driving. That being said, these companies self-certify. So the government doesn't check the software. The companies just have to say, you can't audit your driving time. And if they went and put out a software that actually allowed it to happen, unless someone complained and the government investigated and found out that it was happening, then uh, they could get away with it. And so there were some companies in Eastern Europe that were selling a software where the trucking company could call back saying, my driver needs more hours, and they would do edits then. You know, and to try to catch something like that, you just have to really look carefully at the GPS and there's going to be a hole somewhere. I mean, you can only either it's going to show them teleporting from one location to another, driving at a speed that no one could drive at uh, something. So you have to look really carefully at the data. Other thing we call is phantom drivers. And so, you know, they will pretend like there's another driver in the vehicle. So they'll create two logins. And again, the trucking company has to go along with it because they're going to pay this driver for what both drivers are doing. Uh, or maybe it's an owner operator and he's just doing it himself. Basically, they're going to drive once under one name and once under another name. 
and that way they can keep driving. Uh, there's something else called unassigned drive time, where is if you, if you just don't log in the system and drive and just hope you don't get pulled over uh, and have anyone check your logs, which, you know, you got a 99.5% chance of not getting pulled over any, mm-hmm. any given day, then, you know, it doesn't show up on your log because you're still shown as off duty that, during that time. So for that, again, what you want to look at is if someone logs off duty one location to rest, and then when they stop their rest and come back on duty, they're at a different location. You have to think, well, how did their truck move from one location to another? One way is unassigned drive time. Something else, and again, the company is supposed to get a report on any unassigned drive time, and they're supposed to try to figure it out, but they don't always do it. Um, and especially if the company's telling them, hey, you need to keep going because we got to get this load on time, just you know, take a chance and go unassigned drive time. They can also do something called a personal conveyance. So let's say you know, the truck driver is off on their off-duty hours. Well, they, they want to go eat. They can drive the truck to a restaurant or they can drive the truck, you know, to like a store to go shopping. That doesn't count as driving time because they're not working. But what they'll do is they'll say they're doing a personal conveyance, but they're really uh, moving their load. And we have a case like that with a driver every day. He would drop off the load and then drive the next few hours uh, to the home base and call it personal conveyance. And it isn't. Lots of other things they can do if it's an older truck you know, before a 2000 model year, which is, you know, getting fewer and fewer of those out there in 2023, or they can get a new truck, and they, but they can put an old engine in it. And that's the requirement. Again, you know, sooner or later, all those old engines are going to wear out, but but you can do that. And the other thing they can frankly do is just unplug it and just say what broke and I had to switch to paper logs because the backup system, if your electronic log system goes out, you have to use the paper log. So anytime you see a paper log, just assume it's fraud um, mm-hmm. and look really carefully. Yeah. I mean, the reality is the incentive is still there. So the incentive to falsify the logbooks so that you can drive more time, it didn't go away just because they changed to electronic logbooks. And so people are getting more creative with how to how to falsify them. And, and frankly, I, you know, I don't know about you, Michael, but I, I see it almost just as often as I saw it with paper logs. Um, it's a little harder to catch, but once you learn some of the tricks that are being used, you can catch it almost every single time. I think I've gone from about a 90% falsification rate to maybe a 50-something percent. Uh, so I think it's gone down a little. I don't know if that's because there's less cheating or just it's harder to catch now. But I will say the thing to remember is, you know, we people want to talk about what the truck drivers do wrong. But all the perverse economic incentives on the driver, those are also economic incentives on the trucking company. Because, again, the trucking company typically gets paid by the mile. The trucking company has pressure to get that load there on time uh, to keep their their customer happy. And so the fact is, if we're catching them when they're cheating the log, the trucking company can definitely catch them when they're cheating on the logs if they cared to. And they're not catching them or they're catching them and looking the other way because they want to make more money. And they're the ones that are choosing to pay their drivers this way and choosing to create these perverse incentives. So don't fall in the trap of trying to blame everything on the on the poor drivers. It's really the industry that's set up all these perverse incentives. And you know, come up with all these ways to cheat. I would recommend if you do a lot of trucking stuff, just go online and find some of the trucking forums. A lot of them are open, like Trucking Truth and uh, other ones. And it's truck drivers talking about this stuff. When you do searches, they talk pretty openly about how they cheat on the logs and how to do it. You can only imagine what's being, uh, what they're telling each other, you know, when they're doing, you know, the driver orientation and drivers talking to each other at the truck stops. But you know, there's a pretty big subculture of cheating, and uh, it's not going away with the paper logs. I thought it was going to become a lot less fun when we went to electronic logs, mm-hmm. but I think it's getting even more fun. Yeah, I mean, the mystery is still there. I think the most common way that I see it is that they go to sleep in one place, wake up in another place 30 miles away, and it'll be small distances, but those little small distances add up. I mean, that's, you know, over the course of a week, you know, saving those 30 miles or those 45 minutes could make or break your your 70 hours. Absolutely. And I even saw one, and we weren't able to take the case because the there was no one that could bring the case under the law. In Texas, only the parents, the spouse, or the children could bring a case, and the person that was killed didn't have living parents, wasn't married, didn't have any kids. Um, but an 18-wheeler was driving at under five miles an hour in the interstate because it wanted to get to a location but didn't want to have drive time showing on the logs. It's insane. But that was this driver's idea. To, I guess he only needed a few more miles to go and was just going to try to go at four miles an hour on the highway so they could get to the location, make their money and not, you know, vi- trigger a violation showing on the hours of service rules. Uh, so it's important if you're going to do trucking work uh, to be looking for these things. But 
you know, the electronic logs are just kind of the beginning of this, what they call telematics. These systems that have GPS tracking and monitoring are just amazing. Uh, there's so many different ones out there. Valerie, what are some of the things that you've seen that are kind of cool with what they call the telematics or the you know GPS tracking systems? So I think with a lot of these systems, if we can dream it up, they can do it. <laughs> so if we can imagine what would a really, really safe company want to do in order to make sure that their drivers were safe, they can do it with these telematics and they can get all kinds of reports back to the home base. They can get all kinds of information about what their drivers are doing out there on the roadway um, in ways that are easy to process, easy to digest, easy to read, easy to quickly scan through and could really make a difference for some of the safety issues that we see on the roadways. You know, at first, when I first started looking at some of these telematics, I thought, well, that's great that they can, you know, track if someone's speeding. But if you don't have a real time notification, how is how is someone back at home going to stop it? Well, guess what? They have real time notifications. Um, and, you know, and then you think, well, maybe the reports are really, really difficult to read. And then you see these really beautiful dashboards that some of these telematics companies have that are just, you can click on a driver and you can see how fast they're going at any given time. I mean, it's, they're really, really, uh, knowledgeable systems. I mean, they're just really easy to use. Um, and they're intuitive. And, you know, I think any safety director at any trucking company or even just a regular, you know, commercial fleet can easily implement any of these telematics systems within their, um, safety program. And they're not that expensive because like, the mm -hmm. systems already know, they already know what the speed limits are on all the different roads. Mm -hmm. And you can program it in, you know, if the driver speeds or sometimes they'll give a little cushion, driver goes five miles an hour over the speed limit, send us an email right away. They can even have if the driver slams on the brakes and it decelerates by more than this amount or the driver takes a turn and the lateral acceleration is more than this amount, then alert us. And they don't only do an alert, but then they send a video clip if, on some of the systems of what is in front of the vehicle and what the driver is doing at the time. Uh, and and for like so many seconds before the event. So when a driver slams on the brake, you can see, was the driver falling too close? Was the driver distracted? Or was it truly an emergency where someone pulled in front of the driver, the driver had to slam on the brakes, you should not penalize the driver for reacting appropriately because sometimes you do have to slam on the brakes. But it is just amazing the, the real time. It can all happen like within seconds of it happening. The safety director has the video and then they can also be programmed to give a score or give statistics of, you know, how many what they call hard brakes for 1,000 miles have you done? How many times have you been speeding for every 1,000 miles? Uh, should be zero, but even then they could, you know, they could set a standard that's different than zero and they can know that. And it's really, really sophisticated. They even have systems now that can, with a camera looking at the driver, I mean, they already had it where people could just go in and, and audit, like randomly, let's go look at our drivers, see if they're playing with their phones or playing with iPads. Well, now they actually have them where the system uses artificial intelligence to detect when a driver is picking up the phone and looking down. And it will say distraction to the driver, but it will also then send the video to the safety director immediately. Because one of our issues we've had in our distracted driving cases, we've known for a long time, it's a bad idea to drive distracted. But how does a trucking company dispatcher in Springfield, Missouri, know that a driver is looking at his phone while driving on Interstate 10 in the Arizona desert? Well, now if they spend the money and get the system, they do know in real time the driver's doing that. It's just incredible. Now, the drivers hate it. Uh, the drivers hate having the camera looking at them all day. I get it. I mean, I probably wouldn't want a camera like watching me 24 hours a day. That being said, I mean, they're driving 80,000 pound vehicles on, at highway speeds. You know, there's the the amount, number of people killed and catastrophically injured by trucking companies, I think, justifies the invasion of privacy. And again, they're not taping them when they're sleeping and off duty. They're just doing it while they're driving. Now, what would be, I mean, you know, the, they're not free, right, these systems. Yeah. So what would be the incentive for a company to do this other than just because they're trying to make, you know, the roads safer? I, I mean, I don't know that that's always a, a good incentive for companies, but what, why would they want to do this? Well, there's a couple. One, your drivers just knowing they're going to be watching, going to drive more safely, so you're going to have fewer claims. Uh, the second, you know, they claim in all their studies that the vast majority of of crashes are the four wheelers' fault. Now, I think a lot of that is because the law enforcement doesn't really know the rules, and we do a lot of cases where the police report said it was our client's fault, and when we got into it, it wasn't. But that being said, um, you know, if the crash really isn't your fault, don't you want to have that video evidence to exonerate you? 
But the biggest thing is you're preventing the crash from happening in the first place. You also have better fuel economy when you don't speed. You don't have to change out your brakes as often when you're not slamming on them from falling too close or being distracted and having to slam on your brakes real hard. So there's other economic uh, benefits aside from safety and lower insurance rates and not having your client, your customers pissed off because you, you know, you were supposed to get them a load of something they really needed and you crashed and it didn't get there. Yeah. I mean, I think too, it's important, you know, if you're thinking about these systems for the purposes of a deposition or for the purposes of your case, you know, if they don't have the systems, look at the marketing that these systems do to the trucking companies. I mean, they're not plaintiff's attorneys doing the marketing, right? (laughs) I mean, so look at reasons that the company might have it other than just safety. I mean, I think it can give you a perspective on why so many trucking companies and so many fleet companies in the industry have these systems now. And I think at this point, so many of them have it. It's it's probably the industry standard of care to have them at this point. Now, maybe, it, maybe back in the day, maybe not because they were newer systems, but now pretty much everybody has them. I, I think it's probably the industry standard of care. I think it's a better case if you've had a pattern of similar crashes that could be prevented or mitigated against by using these systems so you can show that they hadn't noticed that they needed them because they had had other crashes, you know, at the same time. I, th- I think the the better case, honestly, that is the not having them is having them and not paying attention to the data. And yeah. I think those are the best cases. If You know, in, in the there's an old Wham song, if you're going to do it, do it right. And so if you... <laughs> Uh, that's been on my mind a lot because we have a case where, the, you know, in this case, the shipper was using telematics to monitor the drivers, but then, you know, didn't do it right. They still were having an excessive number of, uh, of vehicles rolling over. And so that's my thought. If you're going to have the data, then you can't ignore it. Now, how do you get it, though? How do you get that data from them? You know, it's tough. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's... Um... Everybody claims that the data is in someone else's possession. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it obviously lives somewhere and it it's hard. Uh, it is hard to get the data. I mean, I'm not going to, I don't know. You know, it depends on the system, depends on the sophistication of the company, depends on how they have it set up. There's different ways to get it. So if the company has it set up where the only way that they get information about their vehicles is by logging onto a portal for the telematics system, then it's probably accurate that the data is not in the possession of the trucking company. That doesn't mean they can't go access it for you. Um, So then you'd have to learn about how long is that stuff available on those systems. I mean, you'd have to know all of that information and then force them to go access it for you. You know, it's a little bit easier if they're getting reports emailed to them or notifications sent to them. They have to get to your safety department somehow, it's typically through email. So sometimes just requesting the email notifications for those reports is how you get a lot of that data. And they come in really pretty uh, formats that are easily readable. Um, You know, you don't get some kind of data dump of some computer software that doesn't make sense to anybody or not. I mean, it makes sense to computer engineers. And then you have to hire some kind of software engineer to tell you what it says. So there's, there's different ways. It all depends on exactly how the information is being accessed. You could also download information directly from some of these devices, but not all of them. So it's, I mean, <laughs> they're all different, frankly. Yeah. I think it's really important if you have one of these systems is to find someone uh, that has experience with the system, with the dashboard to find out, you know, how can it be set up? What, it, what information is available? How can, how can you get it? Because a lot of times, you know, they play games with us. Well, we don't have it. It's not in our right. position. And it, you, know, you can just log on, run a report. But if you can have your expert, like, basically go do the screenshots and you, you do a request for production, like run this specific report from the program, and then you send them screenshots, this is exactly what you have to do, then it's really hard for them to argue to the judge they couldn't do it. Right. Also, you know, learning from experts, some of the things they can do uh, is like, let's say you have a, a stretch of road that a commercial vehicle needs to drive slower than a regular vehicle. There's something called geofencing. You could actually... Just go to the map and draw like a box around that section of road and set the speed limit for the getting the alerts at a lower speed limit. So let's say you have a curve and you have like a tanker truck. Tanker trucks are supposed to go 10 miles an hour under the curve speed. So say it's a 55 mile an hour limit, 45 mile an hour curve limit. Well, then you should be going 35 if you're driving a tanker truck Uh, and they can actually program that in there. Now, you know, I don't think that they could go through the entire United States and look at every single curve, but if they're in an area where they're going to be driving, you know, making the same delivery over and over again, that might be something they need to do. But it's just 
really amazing how much they can do and how easy it is. But they'll play games with you. And like I said, just finding an expert who has played with the system and then hopefully you can just sit down with them and, and look at it and play with it yourself is ideal. And in fact, I think one of the things we're going to be doing next year is like, you know, getting one put on our farm suburban mm -hmm. and just uh, seeing how easy it is to track and, and seeing what kind of games you can, not games, but what kind of reports you can do, what kind of data we can get, you know, just so we have a little more knowledge of what they have, because I do believe they play so many games with us and board games and well, I don't know, but they could download it really quick. Each year, the law firm of Cowan Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide on trucking and commercial vehicle cases. If you have an injury case involving death or catastrophic injuries and would like to partner with our firm, please contact us by calling 210-941-1301 to discuss the case in detail and see where we can add value in a partnership. And now back to the show. And I also know that for some reason, whenever I get a report from one of these systems in discovery, it's like this weird, you know, Excel spreadsheet with all these weird formulas and it doesn't make a lot of sense. And I've seen online what the reports look like and they don't look like that. So what kind of weird, you know, whatever have they done to the report before they gave it to me. I don't know. Yeah. So we have to learn what data is available, what reporting formats are available and, you know, get really specific because they're not to tell the judge or judge, we give them the data. Right. But if you can tell the judge, like, this is what they gave me, this is what they can give me. And, you know, here's an affidavit from my expert talking about how easy it would be. Then it's a lot easier to get it. But, uh, you know, you got to you have to make the time to do the work, you know, when you have a good case here, because they they aren't just going to give it up for you. It's like anything else. You know, you always have to fight to find the truth. Something else I'd like to talk about is apps that create distractions. What are some things you've seen on the telematics or the other kind of apps that actually, you know, could potentially cause a crash? Well, every single application on your phone can cause a crash. I mean, <laughs> they're all they're all distracting. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It doesn't matter if you're playing Pandora. It doesn't matter if you're scrolling through your photos. All of those are distractions because they require you to look down and look at your phone. I think a lot of the newer 18 wheelers and a lot of new, just regular vehicles, they have, you know, Apple CarPlay or something like that. That helps, right? Because you can do a one touch activation of a call or of moving to the next podcast you want to listen to or whatever it is um, without having to look down at your phone. But if you have to look at your phone to do anything, it's definitely a distraction. So, but what are the applications that I think a lot of people are using while on the road? I think it's very common that especially truck drivers are using Facebook or FaceTime or making calls, talking to people for long distances. They're making videos or making TikToks. They're, um, they're bored. <laughs> yeah. They're bored. They need something to entertain themselves. They watch movies, you know, they're not just listening to a podcast. Like you would be listening to the radio. There's, there's a lot more going on. They're watching YouTube and you can see some of these truck drivers have their own YouTube channels and you can see them videotaping themselves down the road and you just think, oh my God, that's just just a accident waiting to happen, right? I mean, just uh, looks awful. Um, so all kinds of things on your phone that people are doing because they're bored on the road. They're spending 11 hours on the road on, behind the wheel, most of yeah. which is nothing interesting to look at. <laughs> yeah, I think it's so important, especially before you file a lawsuit, you know, before maybe a lawyer tells them to clear everything up. I mean, go see what all they have online and, you know, try to find their TikTok, their Facebook, their Instagram, whatever else they have. Because uh, you will find it's crazy. You People, they're sitting there, they're filming themselves driving. Mm -hmm. I mean, then they, sometimes they put crashes online too, and some of these these groups, you know, to talk about them, and they, they're trying to blame the four wheeler for the crash that happened. And you look at it, and they're doing something really stupid. Yeah, uh, and it is crazy what they put on there. Uh, but also, you know, to really get this stuff, you got to get the phone downloaded, and you got to get it downloaded as quickly as you can. Um, what we found is, for about a week on most of these phones, you actually get like second by second if you get the download and you get all the data. The location of the phone, the latitude, longitude and latitude coordinates, the speed at which it's moving, and then everything that's happening on the phone, whether they're opening an app, closing an app, pausing a song, interacting with something. What And, you know, it's even more powerful, I think, when they're opening, like, emails from work. Someone sends them an invoice. Someone sends them the directions, the some kind of load confirmation sheet. 
So work is actually distracting them when they're driving. I mean, I think it's distracted driving is always bad, but if you could have the company distracting the drivers, I think it's even worse. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, pretty much all of the communications that most truck drivers have with their dispatch is through their cell phone. I mean, they don't really use the radios anymore. I don't think they use as much the messaging systems through the, you know, uh, devices that are in the trucks. I think mostly it's through cell phone. And a lot of it doesn't show up on the cell phone bill. You cannot just get someone's cell phone bill to tell they're on the phone because it will tell you whether you're making a phone call using the telephone app, the telephone function. And whether you are sending a text, an SMS text, it even an iMessage doesn't show up on your phone bill. And definitely if you're using WhatsApp or one of the other uh, programs, neither the voice call on WhatsApp nor any messages you send on WhatsApp will show up on your phone bill because that's all data. That's not considered a message or a phone call. It's mm -hmm. considered an app using data. And so... The only way to find that out is to get the phone and you want to get it as quickly as possible while, because what happens is the phone holds an enormous amount of data, but it's always downloading new data all the time that's overriding the old data. So even though they have gigabytes and gigabytes of data nowadays, it's still only enough to hold about a week's worth of the super detailed stuff. Now, you'll get messages, you'll get other stuff that go further back in a week. But if there's any way you can get that phone frozen and downloaded, even if you can't look at the download yet, even if you're going to have a fight about that, just like get it, get the mirror image made of the phone, get all the data preserved, and we can fight about who gets to look at what later. Uh, now, there is a conversation now with your own client before you do this sometimes, because sometimes our clients have things on their phone that they don't want anyone else to know about. Uh, if it's you know related to what happened, what they're doing at the time of the crash, you may not want to look at the other person's phone if they get to look at yours. If it's related to something that's personal and embarrassing, you may be able to exchange relevant crash-related information while protecting, you know, maybe your client's conversation with their wife that they wouldn't necessarily want the world to know or the conversation with someone else they wouldn't want their knife, wife to know about or whatever else it is. Right. Yeah. I mean, I do want to warn people, though, that it, it is harder than it sounds to protect things that are not related to the crash because of the way that you get data from these phones. It's it's a tough road to climb. So, I mean, it's a real, real serious conversation you need to have with your client and you need to know the extent of what needs to be protected because yeah. sometimes it, it is harder than you think to just give this one piece of data because all of the data kind of interacts yeah, what you it's each other. What you basically have to do is let their expert download the whole phone with the agreement that their expert will let you review all the data and be able to redact things before they give it to defense counsel. And then you just have to hope that the defense expert is going to follow the rules, which they may or may not. Right. I mean, I think there's not a way that you can give the phone, as far as I know, there's not a way you can give the phone to an expert and say, download only for the day of the crash. That, no. That's not how it works. And they so, to, uh, yeah, they have to download everything and then filter out with that, but they still have to right. have the complete data, the complete one to filter out. Right. So I think um, there's also applications. I mean, there's your typical distracting applications, right? TikTok, Facebook, that kind of stuff. But there's applications that truck drivers have specifically on their phone that can be distracting. So there's um, some of the logging, the electronic logs are actually on the phone. You know, so there's actually truck driver applications that can themselves be distracting. Yeah. And even the ones that aren't on the phone, like the Qualcomm system, for example, they can send messages and... You know, depending on what the settings are, those messages may come out while they're driving. Um, depending on what the settings are, they may respond while they're driving. But even not just the message popping up is distracting. Mm -hmm. uh, even if it's a safety message, uh, be sure you don't drive distracted. But that's popping up while you're while you're driving. That's not very helpful. Right. Much worse when you get to like the Uber and and Lyft and uh, Uber Eats and those kind of DoorDash, those kind of apps that. Not just while they're driving, while they're on duty, but when they're off duty, they want to keep the driver paying attention to the app in case a ride or delivery comes up. And so they're constantly, it's called gamification. Uh, Gene Murray Whalen, a great lawyer in Florida, has a, a, a case where they're suing Uber for the design of their software system causing distractions to drivers because they had a driver that was not, did not have a passenger in tow, so they only had 50,000 coverage, run over a pedestrian and cause catastrophic injury and they, they survived summary judgment on it. Uh, so it's an ongoing case, but it's, they've really looked into how this, these apps are actually designed to keep the drivers engaged because they, they want to make sure that when there is a ride, that there's someone's, you know, right there ready to go pick it up. Uh, but to do that, they have to keep them looking at the screen while they're driving. 
Yeah. Well, yes. and I've definitely been in an Uber where they're using the app for more than just map directions for my own Uber ride. You see them interacting with it because they're getting notification of the next ride. Yeah. Um, and they have to look at it to see if it's something that they want. And so they're sitting there looking at it while they're supposed to be driving you. I mean, I've seen it happen while I'm in an Uber. <laughs> so. And that's all Uber's choice. Uber can choose that only comes up because it knows how fast you're going, that it only comes up when you're not moving and you don't have a passenger in there. But because they want to make the money on the next passenger, they want to keep things going. They choose to create the app to create alerts and allow interaction while drivers driving. And I think they should be held liable for that if they cause harm. So how does someone learn about, you know, what what these if you want to learn more? OK, you, you think one of these apps or one of these electronic devices is you know, present in your case. You want to kind of figure out more about how they work, what data is available. You don't necessarily want to start off by paying, you know, thousands of dollars to an expert. What do you do? Become a software engineer. No, I, you, I, I mean, I always start with Google whenever I'm looking at anything. There's all kinds, I mean, you'd be shocked at how many weird rabbit hole YouTube videos you can watch about some of this stuff um, just to kind of learn how it works and what the um, design theory behind it is and all of that kind of stuff. So even just watching just random people on YouTube explain how these apps work. And, you know, especially the truck driver ones, they're, they're all into doing YouTube videos showing you how to do their um, their logs or, I mean, you know, yeah. how the apps work and stuff like that. And, you know, companies themselves even release YouTube videos about how to do certain things because their drivers are out on the road. They're not they're not in the terminal to to get this training. So they just release it through YouTube. But um, I think I would start there. I would start with Google um, and YouTube and then escalate from there, right? Decide if it's really something that you think is worth investigating in your case, because it is an expensive investigation. So you have to determine, can the case weather this kind of information gathering that that's going to be required, not just from an expert point of view, but I mean, it's just going to, it's going to be a big time commitment. And are you going to get something that's useful to you, right? So if you don't have to prove for your case that someone's on the phone, you know, do you, I mean, do, well, do you need to go down that road? Right. I mean, if they I, rear ended someone and it's, it's, you know, your injuries aren't worth more than a million dollars, then, you know, you don't have to prove they're on the phone to win. So, you no, know, but if you, um, but if you can, your case is worth more. It can be. So you have to just kind of decide what is yeah. the, what is the value of that for yeah. the purposes of your individual case before you kind of go all in. But I think doing a little bit of research ahead of time to see what you think you might get and what you think you're able to get. I mean, if someone hired you almost, you know, two years after the crash happened, doing a bunch of data downloads of a cell phone is, is not going to get you a lot of information. So right. why go, why go down that road? Yep. Yeah, I will say also just going back to the apps, uh, especially the telematics, uh, programs. I mean, just going, finding your, figuring out what telematics provider it is, which you can just send an interrogatory or ask a question at depot. But I like to get it way before I do the depots and just go to the website. And it talks about all the different things you can do and how easy it is and the videos. And again, like you said, YouTube, just so you can go figure out what information is available. Uh, but I think anytime you can prove a driver is distracted, it's a huge uh, value multiplier in our cases because Every juror thinks that they can safely talk on the phone and text while driving, and every juror thinks that nobody else can, <laughs> that right. everyone else is right. in awful danger. And I think, I think it's really up there with alcohol and drug use in getting jurors uh, triggered to allow big verdicts uh, when you get this stuff. And I think it's something we should definitely be looking at. And, of course, the other thing where I think it's really good is cheating. I mean, anytime you get someone lying and cheating, you know, you look at what are the characteristics of a villain. You know, one of them is being deceptive. Another one's being immoral. Uh, so, you know, lying is deceptive by definition, and it's also, you know, lying to do something dangerous and endangering other people and trying to cover it up is immoral. So I think those kind of things are the kind of things that make a juror conclude that the defendant is the bad guy or the villain of the story and, and that they need to do something about it. So I think these are really good opportunities, you know, to get the kind of the raw ingredients of our trial story that we can then mesh into something that's compelling, moving, and will hopefully get justice for our clients. Well, I hope you all have enjoyed uh, this. I know it can get really deep and dense. If you want to learn more about telematics and electronics, uh, I recommend you join us at our Big Rig Bootcamp on June 16th. You can sign up at BigRigBootcamp.com. It's going to be here in San Antonio. It's going to be a lot of fun. You get six hours of CLE 
were accredited in Texas and you are going to be accredited in Texas and New Mexico and uh, other states. I, I guess you can go and see if your state will recognize it. But it's going to be, you know, six hours. We have some little bit of ethics in there, too, which is going to be a game show format. It's going to be a lot of fun. We have door prizes, music, light show. It's just going to be a good time. Uh, and we get to, you get to meet Mallory and me and Sonia and everybody else. And uh, we hope you can join us. Thank you for joining us on Trial Lawyer Nation. I hope you enjoyed our show. If you'd like to receive updates, insider information, and more from Trial Lawyer Nation, sign up for our mailing list at triallawyernation.com. You can also visit our episodes page on the website for show notes and direct links to any resources in this or any past episode. To help more attorneys find our podcast, please like, share, and subscribe to our podcast on any of our social media outlets. If you'd like access to exclusive, plaintiff lawyer-only content and live monthly discussions with me, send a request to join the Trial Lawyer Nation Insider Circle Facebook group. Thanks again for tuning in. I look forward to having you with us next time on Trial Lawyer Nation. Each year, the law firm of Cowan Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide on trucking and commercial vehicle cases. If you have an injury case involving death or catastrophic injuries and would like to partner with our firm, please contact us by calling 210-941-1301 to discuss the case in detail and see where we can add value in a partnership. This podcast has been hosted by Michael Cowan and is not intended to, nor does it create the attorney-client privilege between our host, guest, and any listener for any reason. Content from the podcast is not to be interpreted as legal advice. All thoughts and opinions expressed herein are only those from which they came.